My lady, good morning. You know that I appear on behalf of the appellant, and that yes. I appear with Mr Murray, my junior, and my instructing solicitor, Ms Khan, all of whom represented the appellant below in court today. I think you know that Ms Kavanagh, King's counsel, appears with Ms Chowdhury, that neither of those advocates were present at the hearing below. Yes. Uh, they are uh, assisted by uh, an interpreter, an Urdu language interpreter, who is the gentleman at the back. See him standing, so, yes. so you can identify him. It may have been obvious who he was, anyway. And so it'll be clear to you who the respondent mother is sitting yes. next to him. I should perhaps have said that my client, uh, the appellant, is sitting in the row in front. He's the gentleman in the suit. Yes. Uh, and then the local authority team, represented by Mr. Goodwin King's counsel, Mr. Yes. Monu Aqua, who both appeared below. Yes. Uh, and as I understand it, I think we have the local authority legal and social working team in court as well. Uh, and then finally, Mr. Wilson, Wilson appeared intermittently at, at the hearing for a couple of applications made during the course of the hearing, but I think. But predominantly, it was the children's solicitor, Mr. Darlow, who represented the children's guardian. Yes, well, that would be the norm. Yes. Uh, and so I, I, at that point, I should say, perhaps, and I think this may have been mentioned to you, you have not seen the intermediaries report that was filed within the proceedings below. No. There is a recommendation, or was a recommendation, for 60 minute breaks, so breaks after 60 minutes for 15 minutes. And that would have been apparent from the transcripts yes. that that is how we were operating. The proposal, subject to your view, is to replicate that. Well, I'll, I'll discuss that with Ms. Kavanagh in a moment, if I may, Mr. Uh, Vine. Um, if I can just say, we've all had an opportunity of reading the papers. Uh, and that's included uh, uh, looking at the transcripts. They no doubt will be taken to them in some limited way. Uh, I'm confident uh, that Lady Justice McCurr listed this for a day and a half because she didn't know how the transcripts would, would come out. Uh, we're clear in our minds, having done substantial pre-reading, that this is a matter which can be completed in a day, uh, even with the benefit of any breaks that we decide are appropriate. Thank you, my name. I, I hope, um, I presume that you would all be uh, of the same view once we'd had a chance to look at the transcript. So just from the point of view of allocation of time, I thought it useful to mention that at this stage. Thank you, my lady. In terms of running order, yes, we sir. are agreed, and it may not surprise you, that, that I should be going first. Of course. And, and that Miss Kavanagh will follow, I suspect, quite briefly. Yes, I would uh, anticipate that. Then Mr Goodwin will follow yes. that, and Mr Wilson at Wrap the end up. of that. That's, that's the, the running order yes. we commend to you. What I don't know, and I'm not judging well, is my pace in terms of the Urdu interpreter. Yes. I, I, I think it might be useful if the interpreter and the mother uh, moved to sit behind junior counsel. My lady, the reason they're there and the reason my client is there is the live stream. And a, oh. that's, that's the reason for it. Yes, I, I fully understand that. Just give me a moment. We, we, we think that, um, notwithstanding, that it, from a practical point of view, it would be more satisfactory um, if they were behind counsel. We think that it's important that live stream remains on, um, particularly given the very serious allegations in this case and serious findings in this case. Um, so we, um, Mr Interpreter, we will all do our level best to speak at a pace that you can interpret and at a volume that you find comfortable. Um, uh, but uh, can I d just take a moment just to remind everyone of the great care that needs to be taken of not to identify uh, in this case. We do have a 90 second delay. So if there is a disaster because someone, because they're focused on their submissions inadvertently, uh, identifies anyone, 
um, we, we can deal with that. My lady, thank you. My, my next note to myself was child A. Yes. Because I, I know just to look at the first page of the first document I wrote, it would be very easy for me to read that out to you uh, and uh, reveal an identity. Absolutely. But I, I think we have all yes. tried to refer to the child who sustained yes. injuries as child A. Yes, I, I have to say for my own part, I find it very impersonal and very difficult to refer to children by an initial like child, particularly when you just pick the first <coughs> letter of the alphabet. Um, my own preference is usually to choose a name that the parents feel is acceptable but is not identifying. But it's child A throughout in these proceedings, so I think we should stick with that. Thank you. Uh, make it very clear to the parents that uh, we would uh, not, we are not being impersonal um, in in referring to their child in that way, but we are simply um, protecting their identity. My lady, so far as I'm aware, there are no other preliminary matters from the well, bench. Let's uh, just deal with then with, with breaks. Now, Miss Kavanagh, uh, of course, the situation in the Court of Appeal is very different. Yes. Uh, we're hearing legal argument only. Yes. Um, and we have a lot of uh, work to get through during the course of the day. Um, uh, for my part, I'm every 60 minutes for 15 minutes when your lay client is following legal argument? Yes. Well, uh, my lady, the um, position is that she, my, my lay client has um, a borderline intellectual problem. I understand that. Um, and so the primary purpose of the break, according to the intermediate report, was for an explanation time. Mm -hmm. I'm satisfied that I can give an explanation at the normal break that any court would have, which might well be at the lunch of adjournment, but if it's earlier, then in my respect position, then I will use that opportunity to, to give an explanation. In relation to the other aspect of the break, which is to, uh, to give her time away from listening, because it exhausts her, that was only a five minute break. And so um, in my respect submission, perhaps if I have a position whereby she indicates to my junior in the course of the day, or my legal rep, uh, my solicitor does, um, if there is any particular issue with exhaustion, it may be that my client takes a break shortly out of the court. She could and that slip I out. I will fill um, in for her in terms of the, an explanation of what happened in her absence. Well, I'm grateful, um, my lady, for the opportunity to revise that. Yes. And I apologise to Mr. Barton and to the court if I should have perhaps considered mm, that more carefully. Not, than not, not at all. Not at all. And I think that's a. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a very helpful and pragmatic approach, and uh, Ms. Kavanagh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Indeed. Yes, Mr. Well, my lady, you were the judge who granted permission to appeal I on was. three out of the eight grounds that we were yes. advancing. Uh, you made that decision on the 14th of July uh, without giving you the full chronology, and I know that the court is familiar with it. This was a fact finding hearing below that was conducted broadly speaking, in January, with a judgment that followed in April. And I know that we will all be addressing the, the sequencing of the judgment, but that, that's the chronology. Uh, the hearing in April, in August, the appeal hearing had to be vacated because of the absence of transcripts. You've now seen those transcripts, and you've had certainly from me and from Mr. Goodwin, I think verbatim as, as to what we say is of significance mm -hmm. in the transcripts, albeit one day of the hearing for a reason that no one understands was not recorded. Yes. So you have an approved note. Could, could you just tell us uh, this for our note, is how long did the actual case, the actual trial last? It's not on the front of the, the dates are it, not on the front of the It judgment. was a four week hearing. Every day? Uh, it, uh, Mr. Goodwin's shaking his head, I'm, I get from recollection, but uh, so somewhere within the bundle, we have a template of, of the evidence. I had thought it was four weeks within January, but from recollection, we started on the 10th of January right. and we finished on the 4th of February. But it may well be that we did not sit every day right. within that window. Yes, well, I, could, I perfectly understand it, may availability of experts and so on. But, but my lady will have the shape of yes. the case in terms of expert evidence, clinical evidence, paramedics evidence, police evidence, Factual evidence from the parents. Yes. Uh, and 
I started at that point because I know it will be a concern to the court, it's of concern to the parents, just the passage of time. In a sense, this year, each quarter date has led to a development. We've had the judgment in April in its final form. We've had permission to appeal in July. And now we are, we are here. I hope it's clear with a final hearing listed for two weeks before the same judge at the moment uh, on, I think, the 10th of December. And the other thing that I think that we'd like to know is how is A? Well, on my instructions, and on my instructions, all four children are, are in good health. They're, one thing we all agree on, charming, well cared for children. Uh, living uh, in a connected it, person's placement, is that a family placement? A mixture. Thank you. There is contact, there's been a a series of arrangements enabling some fairly fluid travel arrangements for carers uh, and there are members of the family, it'll be apparent to you without revealing yes. where they're from, uh, spread across the globe. Thank you. So, so that's the, the, the general nature of, of the case. Uh, you will know as well, I think, that on the 4th of August, Mother produced a witness statement which wasn't in the bundle. I, I, it, it's not evidence for the purpose of this appeal. But we felt you should be aware of that development because it's something that will have to be confronted by all of us and the judge in due course. Well, it's not a matter for this court. No. Well, that, that was the view we took. and. Most particularly, nothing in that renders this appeal academic. Yes, no, I presume Ms. Kavanagh is not seeking to dissuade us from that. I, I hope that uh, the court has three bundles. A core bundle, which has been amended and is, uh, I can see, uh, at the thicker end of what might be expected. But predominantly, that's because of the transcripts. A supplemental bundle, which was prepared some while ago uh, and gives you e each of the threshold pleadings, each of the closing submissions, notes on the law, matters of that nature, and two pieces of evidence, or two categories of evidence, yes. the, the parents' witness statements and the experts' meeting minute. Uh, I'm in one sense sorry that you had that because I'm not convinced that any of us are going to refer to that in any great detail, but it provides the background as to how the case was argued uh, and what evidence, subject to the important point of oral evidence, was before the court. Uh, and then you have a, a bundle of skeleton arguments produced really for convenience. I, I hope it was convenient. Thank you. Uh, and it includes, of course, uh, the decision in re B about adequacy of judges' reasons. Yes. There is perhaps happily, no bundle of authorities. No. We were in agreement that there were no points of law that were controversial, but there are obviously three decisions that we will each be coming to in our submissions that shaped the judge's decision. In my case, I say should have shaped his decision and form part of the framework for this appeal. Uh, I think one m matter that has concerned all three of us, and you might each of you wish to help us with this, is um, a, an, an annex running to nearly 30 pages uh, with huge citations of the law uh, just simply put on the back of a judgment without any reference uh, to either relevant principles or analysis of that law within the judgment. Uh, we find an unusual approach and we'd be interested to know if it's there's a developing habit of simply putting pages and pages and pages of, of law without any analysis or reference to principles at the back of judges' judgments. Uh, Mr. Goodwin. Well, my lady, I can see Mr. Goodwin's got a view. I, uh, f for my part, I, I've not come across judging in this style in that way. But then we all practice in different areas and in front of different yeah. judges. Um, it, it's predominantly Mr. Murray and I who, who wrote that document. That would be apparent because it's our yes. note. So yes. I, I uh, hope I'm not saying it's inaccurate in any way. It's just, um, you know, s certain aspects of the law apply to each case. And 
Well, my lady, I know that there will be argument in, in due course about whether reciting evidence and reciting law can therefore be taken to mean yeah. analysis of the same. And in any particular judgment, that's going to be a question of fact right. and context and, and interpretation. But I'm, I'm not, a, my view is I'm not aware of that as a, a general practice. Well, we certainly see no analysis of the law in the judgment. My lady, is it helpful to look at the three cases that we say are important? Well, take, take the matter in your own course, Mr. Well, my lady, in that case, I was going to take you just very briefly to what was said in, in Reby, so the first Reby, which should be in the core bundle. I know slightly uh, unusually, two authorities found their way into the core bundle. But it's in the core bundle, electronic page 70, uh, internal page B40. And, and this is the, as my lady well knows, this is, this is the, the guiding decision on how to deal with the question of identification of perpetrators. in a fact-finding exercise such as this. Uh, um, my lady, that starts at paragraph 49. It's Lord Justice Peter Jackson's judgment, and I know that my lady, I think, was presiding I I in that case I I in any event. The guidance that, and certainly all the advocates would be familiar with this, the, the profession as a whole is familiar with this, that when a case is dealing with the question of alleged inflicted injuries and an uncertainty as to whether one person or more than one person is an, a perpetrator, so uncertain perpetrator cases, this is the guidance that we've had from this court and that is being, generally speaking, applied up and down uh, the jurisdiction. The court should first consider whether there is a list of people who had the opportunity to cause the injury. It should then consider whether it can identify the actual perpetrator on the balance of probability and should seek but not strain to do so only if it cannot identify the perpetrator to the civil standard of proof should it go on to ask in respect of those on the list is there a likelihood or a real possibility that A, B or C was the perpetrator or a perpetrator of the inflicted injuries only if there is should A, B or C be placed into the pool my lady needs no introduction to, to that line of guidance from me where we say that matters here is probably quite straightforward the list had two people on in, in this case clearly it did but the first question as a matter of law for the judge was can the probable perpetrator of all the injuries be identified and only if not Should the judge be looking at who was the likely perpetrator uh, from a pool? And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that, but we, we say, and I think it's clear from our documents, that the first line of that guidance, regrettably, was never in the judge's mind in respect of the subsequent, the, the older injuries. My lady, the next authority that I, that I wanted to give uh, the court, again, just by way of framework, it, it is what my lady said in RE LW 2019. It's the, it's the next authority in the bundle, uh, and that's at electronic page 86, page B56, paragraphs 61 onwards. And, and again, my lady, this needs no introduction to you, but you, you would dealing with what are, in some senses, the welfare consequences of a finding that uh, an injury happened in a home where there was more than one carer, and it has been possible to identify who was responsible for that injury. Uh, can it be proved causally on the evidence that the other parent had knowledge of relevant facts? in order to say that of the particular risk alleged by the authority, they knew enough that the injury proves a failure to protect. 
or is that not established? Uh, and my lady, it's rather a longer section um, at paragraph 61 to 64. I, I'm not sure it helps the court for me to read out every paragraph. But, uh, so would you like us just to read that yes, to ourselves? Please. 61 yes. to 64. Yes, please. Thank you. Certainly. My lady was dealing with a case there that was about failure to protect and failure to get medical assistance for a child who'd been injured. Uh, I will be submitting in due course that those principles must apply in exactly the same way to an allegation of collusion after the event, of covering up to obscure the truth. Uh, and the principle that we ask you to take from that is that where an allegation of failure to protect, failure to get medical attention for a child, or collusion is made, it's not, to use my lady's phrase, a bolt-on to a finding that there's been an injury in a household where there was more than one person. It's a question of fact. Has the requisite knowledge been proven to establish that consequential finding. We will be saying that much of the local authority's case about my client was he must have known. And we say that as a matter of law, that could only properly translate into a finding of failure to protect failure to seek medical attention or collusion if the relevant factual basis for that, the knowledge, the act of collusion, is established on the balance of probabilities in the ordinary way. And then, my lady, the, the last point we draw to your attention at this stage, to, by, by way of framework, is what was said by Lord Justice Peter Jackson in uh, in B, and my lady, I think it was your clerk who asked us to make sure that this was before the court. I, I may be wrong about that. I think you're wrong about that. Oh, well, I stand corrected. Because I only got we, the papers yesterday afternoon. Oh, <laughs> well, we, we, we were invited to produce it. I'm grateful for the invitation, wherever it came from. Uh, it, it's a more recent iteration of something that, again, I think at least two of the skeleton arguments touch on, which is adequacy of, of reasoning. Where, where do we find a copy of this? You find that in the, in the skeleton argument bundle. Yeah. And, and there are now paper copies as well as electronic copies. It's the second document. Um, it's page 22 of the paper copy. 24 if you're looking for an electronic PDF number. And the relevant paragraphs are 59 to 61, and they start at page 34. Would you like us to read those through? Well, yes, in the same way, please, my lady.
none of that will be controversial as a, as a legal proposition, but it will be apparent that my client in particular will be submitting to you in due course that the judge's analysis of particularly his evidence, what the mother said that confirmed conversations that there had been between the two of them, and what the expert pediatrician, Dr. Alou, said was perfunctory. I'm confident that when Mr. Goodwin addresses you, he'll be able to find pieces in the judgment where the judge adverted to the topic of the parents' evidence on this and to his judgment, which was that the mother was not credible and that the father was evasive. But that is, we say, respectfully different from an evaluation of what he in particular actually said. And what Dr. Alou actually said about whether chronic injuries would have been apparent at the time to a non-perpetrator. And I hope to develop that in due course fairly soon. Just in terms of the positions of the parties, it, it, it's clear, I think, to you that um, Mother adopts what, what I will be saying but that the Guardian's position has changed during the course of this appeal, moved from a position of neutrality to supporting the local authority on the grounds that are about identification of a perpetrator. I think the Guardian now seeks to uphold the judge's judgment on that uh, and certainly does so in respect of the findings about failure to protect, failure to seek medical advice, collusion, and the father's state of mind uh, about what had happened on the index event. My lady, might I then move on to a, a very brief introduction to the family, yes. who in one sense you know from the judgments, you know from what they've said about them, uh, and uh, I think you know were a family in respect of whom there was an established parenting record with older siblings. They were well-known, visible, engaged in the community with those who were supporting them and caring for both the older children and the younger children after their birth. In that sense, these allegations or these findings as found, the, the presenting events came out of the blue. Of course, there are cases where things come out of the blue. I'm not suggesting otherwise. But we thought it important for you to understand that the father came here in 2004 to make a life for himself. He appears to have done so. The judge was, we say correctly, very positive about his industry, about what he'd achieved in work here, the responsibilities he had, and how, once the parents were married and the mother had joined him here, how family life had been before the birth of the, the younger two children. The index event is quite clear to everyone. My lady, I wasn't with a live stream on going to go through the detail of that, because even that is capable of being a, an identifying factor. But y you referred to how serious event that was. All I'm going to say is that it was a life-threatening event. It is an event in which there is no challenge to the judge's finding that the mother was responsible and that it was an extremely abusive series of actions that led to it. and that the father acted to save that child's life. And that the father acted to save that child's life. Of course, and as you know, 
given that event and the investigations that were undertaken, older injuries were established in respect of one of two younger siblings. Again, my lady knows precisely the nature of those siblings, their ages. I wasn't going to recite any more detail about that other than how very young they were at the time of the 3rd of April. I think I, I uh, appreciate your circumspection from the point of view of the live stream, but I should make it clear to everyone that um, necessary detail may well be in the judgment. Yes. Considerably more detail than, than you're um, going into. Or but my lady, I, I, to, to be clear, it's anonymity and only anonymity, yes. not the consequences of that event yep. that I'm being careful about. And I, I hope we were clear enough in our appeal, the permission to appeal the skeleton argument, to make clear what we accept about that. Yeah. Because what follows from that is if the judge was right, although the father acted in the entirely instinctive, natural and protective way he did on that index event, he didn't in respect of the earlier injuries and any knowledge that he may have had of them. And that, we say, is a conundrum. Well, it's further than that, isn't it? It's suggesting he may have caused the earlier injuries. Yes. I, I, of course there are cases where there are dual perpetrators. Yeah. And of course it's possible that this could be one of them. But we say to reach that conclusion, the judge had to engage with every stage of the evidence on that. Mr. Fine, I've put to the transcripts, um, but obviously I haven't got the original bundles, and nor should I have had them, I hasten to add. Um, but there doesn't appear to have been a huge amount of investigation about life in the household. Um, who did what when? Um, how things were? What the support back was? Well, the there was evidence, uh, both in the witness statements and, and orally, and much of it came from my client about the appointments with um, health visitor professionals following... Well, first of all, there was a period of time in hospital where each of the parents were under quite close observation. Once discharged home, the various natural appointments there were with... Health I'm, not, I'm not talking about appointments. I'm talking about... It, it, it seems to me that... Um, it could be argued, and no doubt Mr Goodwin will deal with this, that the judge ultimately um, rested his analysis on opportunity. And opportunity can be limited, limited or considerable. Well, and, I, and I don't see a huge understanding of the domestic routine, if I, I might put it Well, my, my lady, my client gave clear evidence about the time that he was on paternity leave for the second time, about how he went back to work, about how there were times when he would come back to the household so that the mother could take the older siblings off to do things, uh, so that he could see the children because he liked to be home even though he was at work. So, so he, he put in evidence periods of time when he had opportunity. What, was it put to him that he'd caused any of the injuries? Uh, it, it was, my lady. It was I, put I, in terms. Yes, I, I, I mean, rapidly, uh, and I... Not by you, I mean... No, no, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm no, no, no. I, I, there's a sequence in Mr Goodwin's cross-examination that I think is in my, my analysis of that in the supplementary skeleton argument, where when he's being asked about his wife's actions, he's being asked to consider the permutations. Was it her, was it you, mm. is it something else? I, I, I don't think I can say with conviction that uh, the appellant didn't know he was being accused. He, he did, and I, I don't think I could say he didn't have the opportunity to make his denial. He, he, he denied that from the outset. But it was, we say, uh, an assertion in the end, in the absence of any real evidence about the appellant. It, this is an opportunity case. They both had the opportunity. But we say, in respect of the older injuries, there's some very clear pieces of evidence that point to probability. And the first is the index event on the 3rd of April. 
Yep. The second is how the father gave evidence about the conversations they'd had about that. The third is what Dr. Alou said about the difficulty for a non-perpetrator in being able to identify that a child would have had injuries such as these unless they were present. On the fourth, and we say it's a not nothing point. I know Mr. Goodwin's document says, well, probability, inherent probabilities don't amount for very much. But in a household, which had been an entirely caring household to all intents and purposes until the events that led to us being in court that was well regarded by everyone who worked with them, it is an inherent improbability that there would be more than one perpetrator, in particular, where one acts protectively at the index event and gives evidence about it and answers questions about it. Well, Eddie, I think that probably takes me to what I, I say are the significant parts of his evidence and in passing the mother's evidence and then Dr. Alou's evidence. And so, if I may, I'll, I'll direct the court to the supplemental skeleton argument that, that we produced. And I, the formatting's not easy. I, I'm sorry about that. We couldn't find a way to get the, the PDF into a, a document. But we attempted to extract what was said and put uh, and that starts at page 80 for paper bundle and page 82 for the PDF of the skeleton arguments bundle. Sorry, to commit the page 80. Did you page say? 80 on paper, page 82 electronically. Thank you. In the skeleton arguments bundle. No, I'm sorry. Um, I'm I'm working from. The original sub, uh, skeleton argument. So if, oh. I, if we're looking at the supplementary skeleton argument, can we go to paragraph numbers? Uh, yes, my lady. In which case, uh, starts at ten. Uh, there is a black file. Yes. Yes. Thank you, lady. Which, which is the? But if my lady has a note, has a noted up copy already, then it's. it's That's my problem. I've got it all marked up. So. <laughs> well, paragraph ten. Thank you. And I, I, in fact, I've just told you what paragraph 11 and 12 say. Those are the, the two yeah. lines that, that lines of argument that we say yes. we can develop from, from these points. So these are what follows then is direct quotations from the transcripts. So his evidence in chief, I asked him the question with the judge's permission, have you ever asked your wife what happened with the index event? And my lady has his first answer at paragraph line 14. The second point rising out of that is that that was evidence not just about the index event, but, but what well, my, my lady has the point. Yes, like some injuries, some fractures. Yes, and these and were... We were discussing each report each time I keep asking the these same were, thing. These were open questions, obviously, and they were spontaneous answers. And my lady gets his evidence then at lines 33, 30 four and one as to what his wife's answers were to those questions. On, 
on our evidence, the judge's finding that the mother was evasive was more than justified in these, about these conversations. But his finding that the father was, we say, will require you to stand this exchange on its head. And then at paragraph 14, we move on to the local authorities' cross-examination. And this is a series of questions where he's being asked to consider things that might prevent his wife from admitting what had happened. Could you just, um, I, I think we've all read before and have refreshed our memories from your skeleton argument, Mr Vine, um, but just going back to what I was asking previously, I, I see it um, it's internal page six of your skeleton yes, argument. I've, that's the passage where, where it says you must have known, if yes. it wasn't you Mr X, you must have, have known your wife was not a happy woman, is that right? That, that's what I had in mind when I answered your question a minute ago. And so, going back to my question, it, it, it seems to me that it was never actually put to the father that he caused any injuries. It, it was simply, presuming it's not you for a minute, you must have known. Certainly without any vigour. I think Mr Goodwin accepts it wasn't put. 
No, I accept it was. I, I'm suggesting it was put. It's at G243 of the transcript. Thank you. Well, that's what I was wanting to know. If it's not in the passage, where, where do I find it? G243. Thank you. starts at the bottom of that page over into the next page. Were you involved in putting tissue down? Yep, sorry. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, that's exactly what the passage was. Thank you. But my lady of course that that's about that's about the one event that's not in dispute. In a sense, I suspect the point we have about the bit of the transcript that I've been drawing your attention to is, is clear to you already without me needing to underscore it. But this was a witness engaging with the evidence, on his account engaging with the issues at the time, asking the right questions, telling the judge about it, telling the judge that he wasn't getting straight answers from his wife. And none of that is in the judgment. And it's a very serious omission. What there is, is a very clear assertion that he never saw his wife act in an untoward way, that he trusted her, and with the last ground of appeal in mind, I think I'd have to concede some difficulty conceptualising the allegation about the events of the 3rd of April. But that's radically different from being able to infer that that was a false account to obscure the truth or to obscure knowledge or to obscure failure to protect and collusion. Well, collusion potentially has two aspects, doesn't it? I mean, there's collusion, the evidence when it came to trial and helping the judge to have an understanding, and collusion at the hospital trying to cover up what had happened in the bedroom. Well, the judge made a finding that the father had relayed what the wife had told him. That's the, that was an area of controversy because there were differences in, in, in accounts, but the finding the judge made was that he'd relayed what his wife had told him. So there isn't a finding of active collusion at the moment and that, of the event, and that would be difficult to reconcile with his actions on the night. to that first account given um, at the hospital, which was set out in the local authorities opening in fact, A54. The 
judge then analysed that at paragraph 57. Just that's, the, that's what, that's what, well, no, that's when the judge is reciting the, the father's evidence. Just let me go there again. So here at 57, we have what I'd said to you before about the, the life achievements of the father and the family, his very positive view of his wife and his children, the nature of the property, which was that it was a small property at paragraph 58. You may or may not have picked up one detail of the case, which was that after the younger two came home from hospital, he slept in the spare bedroom with, with one, one of the of children. The children. No, I, I had. So the mother, uh, the newborn twins, and one of the other exactly. twins exactly. were in one bedroom. Exactly. And mother was doing the nights. Exactly. But father was in the other bedroom with the, one of the older twins. Exactly right. Uh, and if mother called for help, so as to speak, during the course of the night, he would go in to assist. Yes, yes. exactly. So, so that's, that's the dynamic. Substantially, the nighttime care was with yes. the mother. Yes. And substantially during the day, of course, because he was at work. although on his own account, and, and I think he volunteered this, there were many occasions when he would come back to the house and somewhere she would go out. Uh, so I'm still, I'm still looking for the, the, the you say at paragraph 57. Well, my lady, I just was giving you 57 is the start of the judge's yeah. uh, summary of the evidence from, from the father. You've got 59, you've got his denial of knowledge, yep. his shock, what he says about the 3rd of April. What, what he said about mother's defence, effectively. Mother's defence was, well, the child did this herself. So Towards the end of 59, during the 999 call, relaying what his wife has yes. told him. Well, I think when we get a little bit later on, we'll come to an analysis section. Um, but working through, the, through what the judge says about the father's evidence, you've got um, paragraph 61, his assertion that it was a decent family, but his recognition that it would be shameful for his wife to make any admission. So, so the judge, the judge in that paragraph, at paragraph 61, which is why I'm addressing you on this, he had in mind the tenor of what the father's evidence was about that, but, but not what the father had said about the questions to his wife and, about, and her answers. So he didn't make, the judge did not make an, a finding adverse to the father based on the original hospital notes. No, we, and, where and we the would... father had said dad arrived, had seen tissue, tried to pull it out no. with his fingers. No, he, he didn't. He, he accepted the explanations that the father gave for that. So he, he's a credible witness on, the, on his account of the 3rd of April. And my lady, paragraph 86 is probably the last paragraph we should be looking at on father. Paragraphs 86 and 87. 87 is in terms of the credibility finding. Yeah. Thank you. 
my lady, what we say, if you, if you read that transcript through, there's an enormous difference between what he's positively saying about his challenge to his wife and the separate point he was making about what he knew to be her qualities. Now, a judge can reject his account. Of course a judge can reject his account. But that was a very particularized, consistently stated account of wanting to know. And it was fundamentally <coughs> inconsistent with any of the propositions about him knowing. Whether knowing because he's a perpetrator or knowing because he colluded or failed to protect or, or, or anything of that nature. My lady, I don't know that I need to take you, unless it would assist, to the, what the mother said about those conversations. Her evidence in chief and in cross-examination was that they had had those conversations. Effectively, she said she didn't know. Thank you. And that takes me on to Dr. Alou, paragraph 16 of the Supplemental Skeleton Argument, paper page 87. And this is about symptomatology of the injuries that we're concerned with. No, I think we've all read. Well, my, my lady, in which case I'll, I'll put it fairly shortly. The only witness in a position to give expert evidence was Dr. Alu on sim likely symptomatology of metaphyseal rib fractures and chronic head injuries. There can be no doubt on the transcript of her evidence that it was her opinion that a non-perpetrator may not have known that the fractures had been sustained. The chronic head injury is a little more complex. And I I'm going to step back one stage in the analysis to explain that. When she wrote her reports, there were no neuroradiological opinions. So she was unaware of the opinion that there was evidence of a chronic head injury. And matters then came in very quickly. And so her evidence is, is oral evidence on the symptomatology of that point. We didn't feel, rereading the transcripts, that she was very clear answering certainly my questions about symptomatology. But Mr. Goodwin is right that in his questions, he did ask that question. And the transcript shows very clearly again, and it's in his skeleton argument, that her, effect, her answer on well, what would the symptoms of a chronic head injury be, it rather depends. So the court had no medical evidence from which you could infer guilt or knowledge from a non-perpetrator from the absence of any account of symptoms. the father was saying, which is, well, I never saw anything, and nor did any of the people who came, health visitors, midwives, doctors, entirely consistent with what the expert evidence was. And, and my lady will know, I know, that that wasn't very controversial paediatric evidence about these sorts of injuries. I feel that I've really addressed you on all that I have to say on grounds three to five, the, the perpetrator question, and what we say are the problems in the judgment that can't be put right by reading it as a whole. Would you like to just, for completeness yes. sake, 
that take us to natural passages. Yes, it's at page 13. Paragraphs 37 to 38. 37 is unhelpful because I repeat something I said before. But I, I think my lady has the, the outline points we, we were making about the nature of the evidence. That The real crux of the argument on 3 to 5 is at 38. The question of the perpetrator of the chronic injuries just wasn't in the first judgment when it came down in draft. Now, that's not necessarily fatal, but it gives an indication as to the starting point. At the end of the day, though, we have to look at the final judgment. Yes, but it, that's the starting point, and so the question really is what's in the final judgment and whether it addresses that, that flaw. Second point, no reliable direct evidence to distinguish between the parents and come to a view. And, and there we say that, that simply did not engage with the significance of the 3rd of April, the significance of the credibility findings made about that, the inherent probabilities of there being two perpetrators, and the inherent improbability that if the father was able and willing to assist the court on the 3rd of April, that he wasn't also trying to do the same in respect to the rest of the injuries. Not, none of those features compelled the judge to accept his account. But all of those, we say, required the judge to weigh the pieces of evidence up and the actual evidence rather than summary views and to weigh them against the legal test that the judge then had to apply. Because it's quite a straightforward question. Who probably caused the older injuries? And only then, if he couldn't be identified, then who was on the list of people who had a real likelihood of, of, of having done so? What, what, one of the things that occurs to me, I'd like to, to know your submission on this and Mr Goodwin, is that when dealing with the uh, failure to protect at 96, the judge makes the finding um, that the mother's relationship with the injured child was that of a highly dysfunctional parent-child relationship. Um, is that not something that perhaps should have been fed in at 92 when deciding whether or not the early earlier what might have been regarded as harbinger injuries um, was evidence where he'd found that there's a dysfunctional parent-child relationship. Uh, and what would have been apparent in that respect? These are... I'm not talking about failure no. detector, I'm talking about the pool of perpetrators. The judge says at 92, to identify the mother as sole perpetrator would be straining too far beyond what is evidentially sustainable. It would be based on no more than speculation or conjecture. And I'm just asking you to put that next to his finding. Is it is it just speculation or conjecture when you've made a finding that the relationship is dysfunction, highly dysfunctional? Well, it, it's directly relevant, my lady, to, to the question of identifying the probable perpetrator. I said that's the point I was making about the third of April, perhaps, rather than the. The interpretation of that that, that the judge made, but it, it comes back to the same root. It's it was never the case that there was nothing to distinguish between probable perpetrators in respect of these older injuries. So your point is, although the judge appears from the judgment to have been aware that that was a potentially distinguishing factor, he didn't analyse why it was a potentially My distinguishing lady, he, factor. He didn't, with, with respect. It, it just is missing. A and it's not a judgment where you can say, well, we know what he had in mind, because he, for instance, adequately summarised the themes of the father's own evidence and, and, and the medical evidence. I I'm sorry to say we think he picked pieces and not all of it. And that's probably where he fell into error. Yes, 
So really, that's grounds three to uh, five. Grounds six, seven, and eight are different types of finding. Collusion and failure to protect. I think from what I said at the beginning, it will be obvious what the submission is that, that we're making. There are cases where you can find a piece of knowledge on the balance of probabilities that establishes either a collusive act or, or a failure to obtain medical attention. This judge doesn't identify any of those other than he must have known. And that was a conclusion which the, the expert evidence tended against, that he must have known if he was the non-perpetrator. In the end, it was an assertion. They are, to use my lady's phrase for, from the authority, they are bolt-on findings, and they were not justified on the evidence that was before the judge. And presumably you make the point in relation to the findings in paragraph 94 that although the judge was not in theory obliged to accept Dr Alu's um, opinion about whether or not um, a non-perpetrator would have been aware of the injuries caused to uh, child A, the judge should have adverted that evidence in his paragraph and explained why it didn't influence his findings in paragraph 24. My, my lady, absolutely. It was very clear factual evidence and very clear opinion evidence. And yes, I agree. Capable of a judge reaching a different view on the totality of the evidence. But that, that isn't what happened. And on the facts of this case, we go back to the, the inherent probability points I've been making, the consequences of the judge's view of the 3rd of April. Yeah. My lady, what's more nuanced I accept is the last ground, the, the finding about failure to have an open mind. I have to concede on his behalf, there are aspects of his transcript, and you've seen them in the sections that we've just been discussing, where he struggled to believe that his wife could have done it. I wonder whether that's failure to keep an open mind, or whether that's simply struggling to believe that his wife could have done it. And it, it's a not unimportant finding that, because my lady will know, that then feeds into final social working assessments of him as a carer, what his thinking is. I have no challenge on his behalf to a judge taking stock of what his thinking was about the evidence at the end of that hearing and coming back to it at the final hearing. But at the moment, the judge's finding is a positive finding that he had a closed mind. And we say that does not reflect the exchanges you saw in that transcript with him. And so although ground eight is, might be seen as a smaller point than the ones that come above it, it's still a point that's going to be addressed at the final hearing. But unless practice has changed, and it's a long time since I've done first instance work, but unless practice has changed, um, absent an appeal, um, a parent in the position you say this father is in, would have an opportunity, together with his legal team, to reflect on the findings um, and an open mind, and, and uh, so that the court can be clear whether or not a position perhaps taken for understandable reasons at trial uh, has evolved and they're able to face the facts. My, my lady, absolutely, and in fact there was a direction for a response document in this right. case in, in the ordinary way. Right. But the court's assessment of, of the legitimacy of that response, of the father's thinking process, at the moment starts with a finding that he had a closed mind. Yeah. And we say that, with respect, was not what the balance of the evidence showed. It showed some difficulty with the proposition, but it clearly showed openness to the issues, willingness to debate them. So my, my lady, although it's a, in some senses a small finding, and a point which can be revisited. We do say that the judge's treatment of that did not reflect the evidence, and that that finding should be set aside as well. Okay. well I've lost track of where my client is. I, I, 
I know he won't naturally tell me if there's anything else he wants me to address you on, but might I just check through Miss Khan whether there's anything else he thinks that I should be addressing you on at this stage? I think we're good. Thank you, my lady. Uh, just before we sit down, um, what do you say if we decided that the judge had fallen into error and that the appeal must be allowed, obviously if, uh, what do you say the proper outcome is? It, it has to be remitted, my lady. I, I, I would dearly wish to be able to argue to the contrary, but with the mother's witness statement as well, with the importance of the assessment of, of, of the evidence, the only outcome we say that you realistically have is to remit. We would say to a different judge. Thank you, Mr. Any questions? Any questions? No, thank I'm sorry. You. <laughs> it's all right. Yes, Miss Cameron. Thank you. My lady, um, my ladies, my lord, um, the second respondent was initially neutral on the appeal um, and communicated that to this court, and her attendance, of course, was not required. That position changed in early August when um, the statement was filed and the communication was passed to this court that her position on the appeal was a full support of the father's appeal um, and that the position was that she did not consider she needed to add or could add to the eloquent submissions already made. The court nevertheless required the filing of a skeleton argument to confirm that position and required her attendance today. Uh, my ladies, my lord, I, I cannot see from the extensive documentation you have or the submissions you've heard that I can add or improve upon the submissions of Mr Vine in any way. The mother's position is a difficult one. Um, there is an open police investigation um, and the um, police investigation at the moment it relates to both the appellant and the second respondent for attempted murder. They have sought disclosure from the first instance judge and that was an application, forgive me, made on the 4th of April, not yet. It may well have been determined. I, I'm afraid the bottle had not been updated with any subsequent order. So, sorry, forgive me, 4th of July, I apologise, with any subsequent order. Um, the position is that, um, as Mr uh, Byne, King's Counsel, has already alluded to, the court um, has in the bundle a, an order from the learned judge, which sets out that the parents were to make a response statement, and that was to be done by the 23rd of May. Uh, the second respondent's response statement was a denial of any uh, or any movement in truth, which you have then seen was moved on by the August statement. Uh, my ladies, my lord, the only aspect which I had prepared a very short submission related to whether the matter, in the event that the appeal was allowed, ought to be remitted or ought to have a substituted finding. Uh, it may be that it's not appropriate for me to take up your time with a submission on that point, but I do have points to make if, if you wish to hear in relation to remittal. And our position is that the uh, matter should be remitted and we fall squarely behind Mr Vine. And if you wish to hear reasons why I prepared them, but if you wouldn't be assisted, I will. No, in which case, it. unless I can assist you any further, my lords, my lady, uh, I have nothing further to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, just before you get to your feet, Ms. Goodman, as we're making very good time, um, Mr. Vaughan, do, do you want to just check whether your lay client, uh, whether, I'm sorry, Ms. Kavanagh, would you just like to check whether your lay client would like five minutes? Thank you. Forgive me, I'm told that she does need a break, if, if that would be permissible. Right. Well, it's, it's uh, 5 to 12 now. Uh, if we're back in and ready to continue at five past. Both great. Thank you. Thank you. so you can add me to that um, submission that, uh, I will, I will. on the long end. Yeah. 